News First Newsline. A very good evening and welcome. This is News First Newsline live here on TV1. I'm Zaymal Ratnayaka for the News First team and today's topic of discussion is certainly a very interesting one. It is IMF discussions, the road ahead. To give you a bit of a context on the developments that took place today, the IMF approved a loan of 2.9 billion US dollars to support Sri Lanka battle the current economic crisis. However, this is merely a staff level agreement and will require approval by the IMF management. However, if this approval is granted, the funds will be disbursed over a four year period, which is an extended fund facility to support the stabilization of Sri Lanka's economy and to boost growth. However, the IMF did present certain conditions that Sri Lanka will have to abide by in order for this extended fund facility and this program to be a success overall. To discuss this and much more, we have invited to our studio, however, joining on Zoom all the way from the United States of America is Professor Shanta Deva Rajan, Professor of the Practice of Development attached to the Georgetown University and also an advisor to the President. Thank you very much, Professor, for joining me all the way from the United States and taking, us, taking time out for your day to uh, be here. Thank you for having me. Professor, I want to, on the outset, ask you this very important question. The IMF presented certain key elements uh, and some of them was to reach a primary surplus of 2.3% uh, in terms of GDP by 2024, uh, raising fiscal revenue, rebuilding foreign reserves and whatnot. We know that the President uh, presented an interim budget or an amendment to the current budget earlier this week. However, we know that the appropriation bill for the year 2023 will be coming forth in November. What sort of realistic proposals, given this latest development, can or should be presented through the upcoming budget in terms of increasing government revenue, uh, through fiscal consolidation, and also increasing or expanding social safety nets and to curtail inflation, and so on? Well, I think most of those elements were in the pre President's budget speech of uh, three or four days ago, mm. uh, and they include uh, three main components. One is increasing revenue. Sri Lanka has the lowest tax to GDP ratio in the world, mm. about 7% of GDP. And we need to raise that. Uh, whether or not there's an IMF program, it's, it's not sustainable uh, uh, at that low levels. And so we've already introduced uh, increases in the value added tax. Uh, and um, increases in the income tax rates, the corporate mm. income tax and personal income tax, as well as lowering the threshold at mm. which you have to pay taxes. Yes. So the, the second component is uh, expenditure cuts. And in particular, the, some of the subsidies, uh, uh, fuel and electricity subsidies, which are basically a subsidy to the rich um, and are hugely corrosive uh, to uh, the, the, the management of the economy. Mm. Um, now, the third element, which is just as important as the first two, is to be able to increase social transfers mm. to protect the poor and the vulnerable from some of these tax increases and expenditure cuts. Yes. Because while I said that the subsidies go to the rich, there's still a component of it that will affect a, a, a component of the subsidy reform that will affect the poor. And we need to make sure that we protect them so that they're able to pay the high prices for electricity and transport and things like that. Uh, so these are the three main components that the government has been working on and, and they've implemented many of these already. They need to go one step further. And I think that's what is going to be in the November uh, budget and the appropriations bill. Uh, with a roughly trying to uh, reach uh, the IMF board approval by the end of uh, the calendar year. Professor, the IMF delegation has also proposed a new Central Bank Act uh, to restore price stability and to provide greater autonomy to the Central Bank. What sort of measures can the government take in achieving this? Well, let me just rephrase that a bit. This is an idea and an act 
that was proposed by the Sri Lankan government under the uh, previous administration or right. maybe two administrations ago, mm. uh, uh, the Monetary Policy Act that went all the way up to parliament. And the reason for that, uh, and it's the same as the reason why the IMF is, is uh, proposing it, is that Sri Lanka has actually been a high inflation economy, not mm. just recently, of course, when nowadays inflation is at 80%, which yeah. is off the charts. But even chronically, Sri Lanka has had a higher rate of inflation than any other South Asian countries, country. And one reason for that is that the central bank has not been able to resist the pressure from the Ministry of Finance to finance the fiscal deficit by printing money. Mm. And this got egregious, uh, this was uh, egregiously shown in the last two years when uh, the money supply increased by 40% over the, the last two years. Mm. So we need to put in place a mechanism where the central bank can, can credibly resist that pressure. And the way to do that is to make it a truly independent central bank. And you, there's international evidence that countries that have introduced central bank independence have experienced lower inflation than countries that have not. So, Professor, you spoke about uh, increasing taxes. They have also proposed increasing taxes. But taxes will naturally translate into higher prices and especially affect those that are the most vulnerable uh, groups in society. So, in terms of expanding social safety nets, we have seen that these social security schemes have been politicized over many years by successive governments. They have been used as political tools to, uh, to appease the people and to, to garner the votes of the people, in essence. How can we go about ensuring that these funds are actually channeled to the groups that are vulnerable instead of this being politicized? clarify one thing you said at the beginning, which is that taxes will increase prices. Uh, if you go back to what we were talking about earlier, mm. where the fiscal deficit is financed by printing money, then an increase in taxes means that you have a smaller fiscal deficit, yes. which means you have less printing of money, mm. which means you have lower inflation. So it's not clear that increases in taxes will lead to higher prices. It could actually lower inflation. Now, that said, you're absolutely right about the social transfers. Um, the Samurdi program has been politically captured. It is, uh, I, mean, I remember looking at some of the numbers, it's something like 30% of those, only 30% of those receiving Samurdi transfers are poor, and about 60% of the, only about 60% of the poor actually receive Samurdi transfers. Mm. Huge errors of inclusion and exclusion in Samurdi. And as you said, what, there's evidence that these have been politically captured in the sense that governments have, that successive governments have used them as political patronage. They make sure that the Samurdi transfers go to uh, people who vote for them and not go to people who vote for the opposition. How can we change that? Well, there are at least two things we, we've, we're proposing mm. to do. Uh, one is to, to change the criteria that you use to determine who is eligible for, for some of the transfers. Right. Uh, because often these criteria are also politicized. Mm. Um, and one thing that some of my colleagues at the Verite uh, Institute have uh, suggested is to use electricity bills. If you, you know, 99% of Sri Lankans pay, uh, have electricity uh, and pay electricity bills. Mm. If you consume less than 60 kilowatt hours of electricity per month, you actually are poor. And so you can use the amount of electricity that they're paying, that they're buying, to, as a criterion for who is eligible for some of the transfers and who's not. And mm. we can show that this is a much more efficient way. This, this reduces the errors of inclusion and exclusion mm. than the current some of the. The second thing, is actually to make it make the payments electronically because mm. one of the reasons why the Samur, there's leakage in Samurdi is that some of these payments are paid by hand you know they send Physically people with envelopes yes. of cash mm. right and th th you know many countries including India and Bangladesh and others have moved on with that because that's much more prone to 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 leakage and mm. capture and I think we can move towards an electronic transfer of uh, the cash transfers 
Speaking of uh, corruption vulnerabilities, the IMF has also put that forward as a condition on addressing corruption in, the, in Sri Lanka and uh, the overall economy as a whole. How can we go about creating anti-corruption framework to ensure greater fiscal transparency? Because we have seen public funds being mismanaged and there are examples that have come to light of how public funds are simply wasted and not being utilized effectively. So how can this government ensure that they do not fall within that same framework uh, and introduce progressive schemes to ensure corruption does not take place moving forward? Yeah, this is a very big problem and it's a very high priority because, again, if, if the government is uh, so short of, of money, we cannot be wasting it on, on, on corruption. Mm. And I think the, the well, what the, uh, the IMF program is uh, proposing uh, is that Sri Lanka introduce legislation that brings it up to the level of the International Convention on Anti-Corruption and they were going to uh, do a technical assistance of a, a corruption audit. Uh, of the country. Yes. Now, that said, I think there's a lot more that needs to be done beyond the IMF program. This is something that Sri Lankans need to do. Mm. And, and there's a whole series of interventions, but they all have one common thread, and that is transparency. The most important thing is that the public is aware of all of this leakage of funds. Yes. So we need to introduce measures where all procurement, for instance, all procurement contracts are published mm. uh, uh, and that everybody knows about them. Um, we need to uh, uh, introduce legislation where, uh, you know, like I was just suggesting, you know, how much of the Samurdi benefits are actually leaking. Mm. Get that information out to the public so that the public then puts pressure on the government. Mm. The, 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 the most powerful anti-corruption tool are the people because they are the ones paying the price. Uh, but we need to empower them. We need to give them that information. We need to get that information out there mm. and, and police the way that that information is collected uh, in order that, the, the, uh, that there can be successful corruption. This has, again, been the, the, the evidence around the world. You know, the just setting up an anti-corruption commission doesn't solve the problem unless you have the public actually aware. And by public, I mean genuinely the, you know, the, the, the women in the village. Mm. You know, they have to know that their money is being stolen. Um, and then they will, and you know, I think the Aragalaya movement was an example of that. When people are aware of that, yes. they will actually raise protests. Right. We are in conversation with Professor Shanta Devarajan, especially on the IMF front and the developments that took place. However, we must now take a look at the headlines for tonight. We will be right back. Stay tuned. News First, Newsline. Welcome back to Newsline Live here on TV One on News First. We are in conversation with Professor Shanta Devarajan. Professor, I want to ask you a very vital question. This is uh, something related to uh, your level of expertise as well, your uh, field of expertise rather. You are acting as an advisor to the president on debt sustainability and I want to talk to you about restructuring our debt. There has been a lot of proposals put forward. There has been a lot of talk on getting a haircut on how we can restructure our debt, should uh, internal debt be uh, restructured as well and whatnot. Let's talk about our creditors and uh, private creditors per se. The IMF says that we need to bring all of them into a table and have discussions on making our debt sustainable and also restructuring our debt in order to tide over this economic crisis. What is your opinion on this, Professor? Well, I think the, the staff level agreement reached uh, this morning mm. um, is, an, is the first step towards achieving a debt restructuring because it, it signals that Sri Lanka has, has a program mm. that has been certified by the IMF to bring down the fiscal deficit and mm. turn it into a surplus uh, in such a way that then Sri Lanka is in a position to pay back some of the debt. Now, having achieved that, now the next step is to uh, uh, identify what is that level of debt mm. that is sustainable, 
Right. Um, and that's the discussion that's following the, the staff level agreement. Once that has re been reached, then you take that to the creditors. That's right. how you, you negotiate with the creditors saying, okay, so this is the level of debt that is sustainable and that will be paid back if we agree. Now each of you will have to take a reduction in the debt service payments mm. in order to achieve that level of total debt for Sri Lanka. So that would be the next step in the discussions. And that, as you said, is both with the uh, private creditors, the international sovereign bondholders, as well as the official creditors, the Chinas and Japans and Indias uh, of the world. Mm. Um, and both of those will, will, will follow from achieving this, um, uh, uh, this level of, of sustainable debt, of, of arriving at this level of sustainable debt. In terms of restructuring our debt, Professor, China is one of the biggest lenders uh, to Sri Lanka for a period of time, and they still haven't seemed to be convinced on whether they will give us some sort of a, a moratorium or even be willing to restructure the debt that, uh, they, that has accrued. However, they are willing to provide a loan to write off previous loans. But do you see that as a sustainable option in terms of uh, making our debt sustainable, Professor? Well, I, I think China has agreed, more or less, at least the rhetoric has mm. been, that China will cooperate with the other creditors in restructuring Sri Lanka's debt. Right. And this has to be a cooperative agreement. Mm. The other thing is that there's a principle in debt restructuring. Uh, it's called intercreditor equity. That is that all the creditors have to take the same reduction in debt service payments. Uh, so that it's not like there's a, a particular deal for China that's different from the deal with Japan or the deal with uh, India. Mm. Um, now, what that equity means is the same cut in terms of the present discounted value mm. of the debt. Um, so, but, so it could take in different forms. For instance, some people might be willing to take what's called a haircut, that yes. is a cut in the interest payment or a cut in the principal. Mm. But others are willing to change the maturity of the debt. That is, you just extend the time period along which you have to pay back the debt. Mm. Those, those could have equivalent present value. So they could be the same reduction in debt, but they're taking it in different forms. Mm. And what I gather from the statements by the Chinese is that they are willing to look in terms of extending the maturity. Right. So, Professor, coming back to the IMF and discussions Sri Lanka has had, we have gone to the IMF on 16 previous occasions, but we have always fallen short uh, of completing these programs. How important is it at this juncture for the government to follow through with all these conditions and to go through this 48-month ex extended uh, fund facility and completing this program in its entirety. It's absolutely critical. Look, the Sri Lankan people have suffered in 2022. Uh, since the beginning of this year, you've had shortages of fuel and food and pharmaceuticals and fertilizer and long queues mm. and, and uh, blackouts, right? Mm -hmm. This program is to try to alleviate that suffering. So it's absolutely critical because if we fail to fulfill this program, we go back to the situation where there's no foreign exchange and uh, people will suffer even more. So it, it, this is, the, the, there's no choice here. They, they have to follow through, um, but it's a realistic program. The government has actually proposed a program that they can follow through, mm. they will follow through. So I don't think we, we, uh, we, we need worry about this. Um, and let me add one other thing, because people keep asking, you know, this, you know is this government going to last and, and things like that. Uh, the one thing that, that's different, uh, I would say, is that this program has also been endorsed by most of the leaders of the opposition. Yes. So and, and consistently. So even if this government doesn't isn't around, there's a good chance that whoever is in charge will follow through on the program because they all understand the reason that we need to do it. 
Earlier today, Professor President Rani Vikrama Singh expressed his wish. He saying that he envisages Sri Lanka being converted into an export-oriented economy. If that is to happen, we need all of the investment that we can get, not just the government, but from uh, external investors. How can the government formulate frameworks that make Sri Lanka an attractive destination for foreign direct investment, investors as a whole, to basically achieve the objective of the president? Well, first of all, it's more than just foreign investment that is going to take to make this a ex truly export-oriented economy. Mm. And so let me first start with the other thing that needs to be done, mm. which is the world's successful export-oriented economies are ones that have also liberalized imports. Right. See, every time you protect an imp imports, mm. protect the economy from imports, you actually raise the cost because you're uh, because of a tariff or, or, or a quota, mm. and that in turn makes exports less competitive. So if, by rela relaxing, and there are still lots of para tariffs in the Sri Lankan economy. Mm. So the first step in having an export-oriented economy is to liberalize imports, allow imports to come in duty-free um, and without, without restrictions. Now, the second, as you said, is that you need foreign investment. Mm. And again, there, the thing that foreign investors want is stability. That's what scares them about Sri Lanka at the moment, mm. is the instability, for the macroeconomic instability, and then associated with that, some mm. political instability. Yes. It's not low taxes. I mean, we, I think Sri Lanka has, has been misguided in thinking that if you allow people to come in tax-free, and there are lots of foreign investors, including Colombo Port and mm. all of those others, that are enjoying tax holidays, mm. That doesn't necessarily attract foreign investors. Hmm. You, you do surveys of foreign investors around the world. Uh, they, they don't say, you know, the only thing that I, th that I need is zero taxes. They want stability. And indeed, it's, it's the other way around because by charging taxes, and I think they should tax foreign investors. And I think the plan in, 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 the, in the budget speech was announced that, that uh, there will be no more exemptions for foreign investors on corporate income taxes. That way, you actually generate revenue, mm. and that increase, increases the fiscal stability of the economy. So you can actually attract more foreign investors by having a very clean, no exemptions tax regime mm. that actually raises positive taxes. And I give you an example of, of Ireland in the European Union. I mean, Ireland has a very low but uniform tax rate for everybody with no exemptions. Right. And they get more foreign investment than, say, Germany. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we are coming into the close of the program. However, I must ask you, Professor, on how Sri Lanka can consolidate its foreign reserves once more. Because in 2019, uh, we know that Sri Lanka had almost 7 billion US dollars in reserves. However, that depleted over time. And now we are the coffers are empty. We are scraping the barrel. And... We need to ensure that we have sufficient foreign reserves. How can we go about ensuring that our foreign reserves are increased over time? Well, I think this whole program that we've been talking about, mm. that is the, the IMF program, uh, uh, will, will generate uh, foreign exchange, mm. some of which can then go into reserves. Yes. Uh, you know, we, the estimate is uh, three billion, $2.9 billion, billion. Dollars from the IMF mm. that will also release about um, one and a half to two billion dollars from the World Bank and the ADB and, and others, mm. all of which will bring in foreign exchange. And then eventually, when Sri Lanka is able to re enter uh, international capital markets, as countries that have done debt restructurings have been able to do in about 12 to 18 months, then you can start borrowing uh, in, in capital markets. Right. The, the key, though, is to manage those reserves and use them genuinely as reserves. Mm. The mistake made two years ago was they used the reserves to pay back foreign debt. That's not a use of reserves. You use reserves as a cushion right. for when you have, when you have an, a, a, an exogenous shock um, and also to maintain credibility of the exchange rate. Right. Tonight we were in conversation with Professor Shanta Devarajan, Professor of the Practice of Development at the Georgetown University. 
all the way from the United States. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for taking time out for your day and uh, enlightening me as well as our viewers on what the road ahead is for Sri Lanka in terms of the latest developments that were made today uh, regarding the International Monetary Fund and the Extended Fund Facility. Thank you very much, Professor, for joining me this evening. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. it was a pleasure. And with that, we must now cross over for primetime news on TV1. And as always, take care and good night.